welcome to the second week of our message series from Little Things, Big Things Come, including headaches. Last weekend I finished by simply making the comment that from the words of Jesus in the Gospel which told us that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed we could move a mountain. So we believe that from little things, big things will come. And so I suggested that we pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the source of life for us. When Jesus gave his, his disciples the command at the end of the gospel last, or well, the beginning of the gospel last weekend, go into the, out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. It was a command that was not just for the people of that time, the disciples, but for us as well. And it's something that we need to respond to. Now, it seems for many, it's a simple response, and they're able to go out and immediately be comfortable proclaiming the good news. For many others, and I include myself, it's a gradual thing, because it's not in our comfort zone to jump into things. We're cautious and are worried about what it might mean what it might cost, and so we need time to think about it. Still others, it's something which is so out far outside their comfort zone that they can't imagine going out to proclaim the good news. It's just impossible, and they don't even consider getting involved. Because everything we do as humans has its limitations, and we can struggle to achieve our goals and our ambitions. There are times when we feel that we're an absolute failure or there are thankfully are times when we've had success and we rejoice in the success. There's an old saying, I think it actually might come from the army, which says something like, proper planning prevents poor performance. That's a paraphrase, I won't go into the original. There are a couple of people who know the original, so I'll just walk away from it. The other thing, could, it could easily be as defined simply as poor planning, poor performance. But when we stop and think, frequently that just comes back to what I do and how I do things. And yet as we listen to the readings today, there's a very real difference between when we think about how man plans things and how God has planned for us and what God asks of us. We go right back to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 2. We read there that God's Spirit hovered over the earth. So from the very beginning of creation, God's Spirit has been part of the story of the human experience. Today we hear how this same experience uh, is now made real in this new creation, in the lives of all Christ's followers. God acts powerfully in the world. And as we listen to that reading from the Acts of the Apostles today, we see that it is powerful. We're told when Pentecost Day came round, the apostles had all met in one room when suddenly they heard what sounded like a powerful wind from heaven, the noise of which filled the entire house. God doesn't do things in a half-hearted way. To make known his divine presence, the Holy Spirit shakes up the whole world so that we simply can't go back to an old way of living because some people think that everything will be the same as it was before. But when the Holy Spirit touches our lives and our world, nothing stays the same. There's a couple of meanings for the word that is used, the Hebrew word for wind, uh, fire, Spirit, it's the word Ruach, and each of these has a presence in what happened on Pentecost Day. But I'd just like to focus on the idea of the wind and spirit, because as we listen to the Acts of the Apostles, that's, so wind and fire, because that's what happened. We're told that something appeared like tongues of fire. These separated and came to rest on the head of each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Another aspect of this new world order comes in the next line when Jesus, uh, when Luke tells us that they all began to speak foreign languages as the Spirit gave them the gift of speech. 
Now, this gift of languages wasn't just so that the world would be reunited and speak only one tongue. It was so that people would be able to hear the message of salvation as if it were spoken with one voice, and that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. It goes back as a reminder to the Jewish people of how in the beginning, in chapter 11 of the book of Genesis, there was the story of the Tower of Babel. The people there were desirous to make a name for themselves so that they might not be scattered over the whole earth. And they built a town and intended to build a tower reaching to heavens. Then they were dispersed because they couldn't speak the same language. Here, the coming of the Spirit of Pentecost, the result of their attempt at greatness is being reversed. So the many languages of the earth are no longer a barrier which separates people. But there is another new one, a new language. And it's the language of the Spirit that helps us understand the message of salvation. But even when people hear the message, they're not always convinced. The book of Acts tells us that at the end of the, the passage after today's gospel reading, it tells us that the people were amazed and confounded and asked the simple question, how does it happen that each of us hears them in his own native language? One of the things that uh, most lectors really kind of get a bit concerned about is trying to read the list of names from that uh, passage from the Acts of the Apostles. So well done, Peter. <laughs> the story, however, tells us that the people of the world came to Jerusalem. They came because they thought uh, although they were celebrating the feast of Pentecost 50 days after the Passover. But as they were listening, some of them suggested these men have been drinking too much wine. Peter goes on in his preaching to say, men of Judea, these men are not drunk. And he goes on to proclaim the story in all its glory. You might remember last weekend there's a passage, as I mentioned in Acts 1 verse 8, we were told by Jesus said to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The power was going to move these people to a whole new way of living. And from this little group of followers will come a multitude of followers who will proclaim similarly that Jesus is their Lord and Saviour. In fact, as we read in the book of Acts, at the end of Peter's preaching on that day, over 3,000 were added to their number. And so the power of the Spirit is quite profound. So Peter's preaching in the book of Acts has an impact on the lives of those who heard it. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, gives us another and very beautiful expression of the difference that the presence of the Holy Spirit makes in the lives of God's people. After he mentions what happens when self-indulgence rules the life of a person, he goes on to list a series of the effects of what self-indulgence does, and he reminds us that they are the things that break people and stop them being able to be faithful people. But then he goes on to tell us that what the Spirit brings is very different. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'd like to hope that when we hear this little list, we're encouraged to think what it might be to be better people. Because when you stop and think about it, they're the hallmarks of what being a Christian is all about. But sadly, we know that these traits, these fruits of the Holy Spirit, are not always, not always present in our lives, nor are they present in the world. And so because of their absence, much of our world is in turmoil of experiencing war and stress. That's why we took the time in these last nine days or so to pray for peace in our world as a specific and direct intention for our uh, Pentecost celebration. The Spirit comes with a purpose. We hear that in today's Gospel. Jesus tells the disciples, when the Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who, who issues from the Father, he will be my witness, and you will be witnesses. 
So even though the group that first proclaimed the message of the good news was a small group of disciples, there is nothing small about the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, John, Paul, John the 23rd called together the Second Vatican Council. He said he was opening the windows of the church for the Holy Spirit to come in. You might remember when we began the preparations for the Australian Plenary Council back in 2018, we were called to open our hearts to the Spirit and to hear the Spirit move in the people of God. Pope Francis, in his call for people to prepare for the Synod on Synodality, invited the whole church to listen to the Holy Spirit and to be attentive to what the Spirit was saying. So if we respond to these calls with a steadfast faith, then the words of Jesus in the Gospel today will be fulfilled. He told the disciples, When the Spirit of truth comes, it will lead you to the complete truth. And that's what we're called to, to be open to. The Spirit opens us to the truth that is God's plan for us. The reason that the Spirit will have it make a difference, we're told, is he will not be speaking this from himself, but will say only what he has learnt. And he will tell you of the things to come. Jesus then continues by saying, You will glorify me, since all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. The Gospel is telling us that Jesus came to make known the message of salvation. But he's making known a message that comes as a continuum. It's not just one moment, not just one thing, but it is continually alive and active in our hearts. Because he says, everything that the Spirit, that the Father has is mine. That is why when I, I said, all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. God gives us the gift of the Spirit, so we know the will of the Father. But sadly, we don't always listen to the Spirit. Sometimes our hearts are made up, our minds are made up, and we fail to appreciate that God is inviting us to have an openness and a willingness to hear a new voice and a new movement of God in our world. So I'd like to finish by praying the prayer that is the prayer for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The prayer simply says, Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. <coughs> Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. At the end of the Mass, as we did last year, I'll offer the opportunity for people to come forward just for a simple prayer, praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit in your lives. Um, that will take the place of our recessional song, so the final blessing. Um, instead of going into a recessional song, I will simply move to the front of the altar and invite you to come forward for that simple prayer and then you may depart as you feel comfortable.